He's installed art outside of the gallery uh, in the public arena or public space from the deserts of Western Australia to the fields of Scandinavia and across the pavements and skylines of London, New York, Rio, Brasilia, Sao Paulo, Hong Kong, among others. He was knighted in 2014. He lives and works in London and the east of England and also in the northeast of England from where he joins us now. Anthony, uh, welcome. You've got a visual narrative to uh, to take us through uh, this journey. So let's um, let's start with images and um, and off we go. Hello, everybody. Um, lovely to be with you, Tim. Lovely that this is happening. I think this is a time where we're all we're all talking about what art can do, um, and I'm really glad to be part of this discussion. So, um, oh, wait a minute. Uh, now, sorry. Can you see that? No, we can't. But we can see you in your studio, which is um, wait a minute. It's, it's a creative start. Uh, just a sec. Uh, I uh, need to do this. Share screen. Can you can you see the screen now? No, nope, I can just see you. I think the host has to allow me to share. If our host could do that, here we go. Let's go. Yeah. Here we go, Anthony. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's it. Yep. Okay, so I thought uh, I should start with, with, in a way, the Paleolithic idea of, in a way, the totem. And, uh, but what happens when you bring an art object down onto the ground and allow people to share it? In other words, share its space and share, in a way, what it does in terms of making a place. And then what happens between people? And I guess that's the big shift. The big shift, I think, is rather than making objects that in some way accept or support uh, the status quo, systems of power and hierarchy, what happens when art escapes from the studio and the institution of the gallery or the museum and comes to live with us in the elements, in shared collective space? Well, so, I should, we should just say this: that was the Angel of the North, Anthony, that you, that you completed in '98 uh, up in Gateshead in the northeast of England. It's one of the most pro prominent public sculptures in England. Just for just for those who don't know. Okay, um, yeah. Anyway, that was the, yeah that that was my ancient history. So that was made in '98, and I think things have changed a lot. Um, and this was made about seven or eight years later, uh, and this is called One Another. And I, I, I like this slide because I think it, it presents the issue, the problem. So here is the fourth plinth made for William IV, uh, never occupied by the equestrian statue, but empty and used as a venue for contemporary art. I invited over 100 days uh, for 2,400 people to come and occupy the plinth for an hour. That was this is London, uh, Trafalgar Square. London, Trafalgar Square. In the middle of Trafalgar Square, and you see behind this participant, uh, who's wearing, uh, yeah, a, a kind of a blazer and 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 yeah, messing about with a cricket bat. Uh, there is Nelson on his column, uh, celebrated uh, after the victory of Trafalgar against the French. So, what what's happening here? I mean, we've got now the the public being invited to occupy, if you like, the, the position of, you know, moral exemplar or great person, hero, uh, but somehow becoming over time, over these 100 days, over these 2,400 one-hour slots, a portrait of Britain at this particular time. And what was amazing is how that constituted its own audience and that people were watching all over the world. So there was a website. We had something like uh, an audience between three and five million over, the, over the, uh, the progress of this show. It was on 24 hours live feed to the world. Um, but there was also, as it were, this participatory audience on the square itself, this crowd diminished and then grew. Um, and it was, in, in, in a sense, an example of, well, participation, but also that participation being, being like an infectious catalyst to wider participation. 
And I guess that is the, the big shift. Do we, we're shifting in a sense from the object which has predetermined values and predetermined representation to reflexivity. And this is a this is a wonderful work that was in the last Munster project by uh, Isa Erkman called On Water. And this is two bits of, a, of an industrial city that didn't meet each other because of this uh, canalized river that divided them. And he simply put a connecting path, but at about 300 mil below the surface of the water. Anyway, this for me was the most incredible example of participation to the point where the viewer becomes the view. And that's a, that, that, that's a trope that has gone into the work of, yeah, obviously Tino Segal uh, of, uh, well, ma many dematerialized uh, art makers that use, as it were, real life as the principal material. And this was just wonderful. I, I, I just had the most wonderful time where, in a sense, you're immediately part of this crowd that half of which is watching as part of the crowd takes their shoes and socks off and dips their feet into the water and with trepidation, you know, walks across. It's like a miracle. Suddenly, people yeah. are almost walking on water. Uh, I, I was... I was I was blown away by the simplicity, but also the poetry of this. I guess, you know, for me, that whole thing, what the frame of art in public places has always been the plinth, has always been this idea that by implication, these are exemplary uh, yeah, representations of the human condition that, that suggests hero or uh, history, anyway, a narrative. But is there something else that is maybe more ancient than that, that is the totem pole that talks about continuity in which actually every level of life grows out of every other? So this is a, this is a work of mine called Mind Body Column that, that is in the very dense part of Osaka. And I think talks about a different attitude to elevation, thinking about life as a continuum. And I guess, you know, that for me was what, this project was all about, which is called Event Horizon. This is its New York, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, showing, which lasted for about nine months. We had 27 pieces. I don't know if you can, just looking at the skyline here, you, you, you can see two probably, um, and then uh, four on the ground. So there's 27 on that meeting point between infinite space and the built world and then a few on the ground that you literally bump into. So here is the, a, a work unprotected by the frame of the plinth with no uh, intimation of hierarchy that somehow in its stillness and silence, in the way that this body, a, a particular body, but in some senses, uh, yeah, expressing the condition that we all that we all uh, yeah, yeah, are, are embodied. And the, the work, so far as I'm concerned, is the interface between the silence and stillness of this intervention on the sidewalk and the flow of life, the time embedded in the movement of people past it. And this isn't, this, this isn't representing anything. This is, in a way, a question in material terms. And it's, and it's the space once occupied by a body cast in iron or fiberglass on the roof rather than being a cast representation of a body. Yeah, I think that's very important to me. So this, is, this, rep, this, this as it were, identifies and indexically proves the place that a body, want, body once was and by implication any body could be and obviously is I mean, I, I talk about these things as industrial fossils. They, they, you know, they, they, they are treating the body as a found object and, in a way, transposing it into mineral or geological time rather than biological time. And, and in then, a way, it's a sculpture that's an epic scale because it's throughout the city or it's on the skyline and the street, but it's also 
most intimately human of scales, which I know is something that you're, you're going to look at um, in, in some, of the, some of the other images that we're going to confront now. So well, I think I mean, scale is just another of those, uh, I think, qualities of sculpture that, that, that are, I mean, with the Angel of the North, there's a sense in which we become aware of our own scale simply because we become like children in relation to this ginormous thing. But I think scale, you know, I also make little objects that in some sense make us into, in, into giants. And I, I enjoy playing with that. Um, but the, the, the idea of this work dispersed uh, over a city that in a way reverses the figure ground traditional relationship between, uh, you could say, the uniqueness of a sculpture and its context. Um, these, these become like black holes where in some senses there's a reversal. These, these are, as it were, voided spaces that then make you even more alert and aware of the context. In this case, you know, you can see this is the Empire State. Um, I just wanted to talk a bit about, in a way, the intrigue, that, 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 that thing of objectified questions. So th this is an incredibly minimal work. This is the vertical earth kilometer of Walter de Maria, uh, now permanent in Castle, but made for, for, for a documentary. I can't remember what, what date, sometime probably. 1977. 77, good. Um, and this is, this is the end of a kilometer long uh, yeah, brass rod that goes towards the center of the earth. You can, uh, it's, it's simply embedded in the pavement. And this is rather lovely because we've got, we've got this statue of Frederick the Great uh, behind, maybe, maybe not Frederick the Great, maybe Frederick the Second. Um, so we've got, as it were, these two opposites of what sculpture in the, in the, in the collective realm uh, can be. Interestingly, he's put it at the crossroads of these two paths. So this is a meeting place where people walking across the city might meet. Now you can imagine that in a way, this work exists as much in the rumor, the knowledge, the understanding that maybe the, the, the people live in Castle understand about this work. And you can imagine a stranger meeting somebody that is a citizen of, Munz, of, of, of Castle and the, him saying, touch the end there. And I certainly did that, and, and maybe I was fooled, but I thought that I could feel the temperature uh, of the core of the earth being transmitted through this, uh, yeah, pure Which is a kind of, rod. But it's a leap of faith, isn't it? And of course, it plays with illusion in a different way to conventional representative art. But we're told that this is real, we believe it's real, it pretty well, we're pretty certain it is, because there's... Uh, it, 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 there's plenty it, of documentation yeah, of the exactly. Movie. Yeah, <laughs> but it's, it still could be something that's barely a metre, isn't it? But it isn't. But I like that leap of faith, as well as the reality of what, uh, conceptually, that which we're asked to uh, understand. And it's, again, an epic work, most of which we cannot see. We can just walk over. Um, I think that relationship between, as it were, the imagination and the evident, evidential is key now to the potential of uh, art in the public realm. And I just wanted to show you this, because this is one of my favorite, favorite works, which curiously, you know, isn't particularly well known. This is, this is Mary Rand, our long jump uh, athlete from the 1964 Olympics. And this is the length of her winning gold jump. And it's just simply in the, in the main street of Wells, a small town in, in, in Somerset. And I just, I love this because in a curious way, it, it invites you to try. And you see it, you see, you know, walking around, you can see people having a go. And I'm they don't failing, get very yeah. <laughs> And uh, there's something really lovely, I think, about the way that this instigates an imaginative participatory, you know, what does it mean to jump like that? It's a very quiet, very unoverstated un work that simply makes you think about the body, about your own body, about its potential, about our relationship with time and space, but in a very, very lovely, simple way. There is a, there is a description at one end, uh, so you know what it's about. 
But I, I, uh, I mean, rather like uh, the vertical Earth kilometer, this is, this is in, in a sense, a way of re-changing the nature of the street and how you relate to it. So, yeah, this, this, is, this is sort of my, I, 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 I was, yeah, very uh, influenced by Walter de Maria uh, and particularly his earth room and his uh, lightning field. And it was, I, I wanted to return to the body, but in a, in a, in a different way, um, uh, you know, in a way post-minimalism and post-conceptualism. But this was my, this was in, in, in a sense, my, my tribute to, to Walter. So this is called Earthbound. And this is me um, in my old department uh, at Cambridge, uh, the Department of Archaeology, um, placing my, uh, yeah, my, my diploma work. When, when, you, when you get accepted into the Royal Academy, you have to give them a work. I gave them this work. They didn't know what to do with it. And I said, well, this is an appropriate place. And Colin Renfrew, who's standing on the left, who is the, then the director of the Macdonald Institute, uh, accepted it. And here is the work being placed now. Uh, and this is what you can see of it. Uh, it's basically the, 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 the index of the soles of the feet now inverted. And I like the way that um, maybe nobody knows what it is. A, a newcomer might not know, but you have that same thing that happens in Castle, where, where somebody who maybe is a student or a professor will be able to introduce a newcomer to it, but then also maybe invite them to stand on those feet. I like the idea that this is testing the relationship between the apparent and the imminent. You could say this is like a three-dimensional materialized shadow that you can stand on and feel yourself, in a way, rooted. This may sound to you, you know, well, wishful thinking, if not a little mystical, but I like the idea that, that in standing on those feet, in some way, you, irrespective of your sex or your, you know, whether, whether you're young or old, uh, you feel somehow uh, earthed, and hence the... The title I, on a rare baking hot day in Cambridge, I stood on those with my shoes and socks off, and actually it, it, it felt very, very warm, both metaphorically and literally. But anyway, that, that was my response to it. <laughs> anyway, moving on. <laughs> anyway, we're, we're, I was supposed to race through these. This is really just to stimulate discussion. Um, I, I guess, you know, for me, maybe Earthbound opens up that whole uh, question of, you know, what, what we need to see in the public realm um, and perhaps this is the hinge that has changed you could say the public statue of the great and the good were always about memorializing you know often victory but certainly the past and i i think that the well the duty and the excitement of making work now that can be shared in collective space is that it should be about the future. It should make you think and feel about the future. You, it should make you think and feel about the status of this planet with our population perhaps rising to 10 billion. Sorry, I, I was just saying that, that the hinge moment, did you get the hinge moment or not? Yeah, for the planet, looking to the future, not the past. Yeah, looking to the future, not the past. So, so this is this is for me about human vulnerability. It is a, a tiny object in a in a huge. There you can see it. This is in the the courtyard of of Burlington House. And what what I really was excited about was the fact that it simply became often uh, the the catalyst for a group of people to stand around and talk about, in a way, us now and our collective future and our responsibility. And in a sense, this, this is the opposite of the heroic sculpture that you might see in the middle of this picture, which is Joshua Reynolds, uh, president of the Royal Academy and founder of it. Um, and rather than talking about heroism, talks about dependency, here is a a, uh, you know, again, an industrialized fossil of a baby taken from the belly or the bosom of its mother and placed 
on the earth. And I think that idea of dependency, vulnerability, of the potential of art to let us collectively think about human futures, well, that's the way we are going. That was a, a, a very eloquent uh, and intense tour through, and we've shifted scales from the monumental to the, to the very intimate at the end. What come, becomes clear in both your own work and in the work that you admire and have been influenced by is the mixture of approaches. In other words, sometimes you can't get more permanent than burying something, well, relatively permanent than burying something in the earth a meter deep or a human body length deep. At the same time with uh, Iron Baby, this was there for the three and a half months for an exhibition. And one another, the plinth piece in Trafalgar Square was there for a hundred days. Um, this mixture of the temporary and the permanent does seem an interesting one because all the classical monuments that we look at, the feeling is they're there in perpetuity, although nothing ever lasts forever. What, what do you feel about uh, the, the commissioning and the opportunity in, in the public arena? Do you think we should look more temporary because we can take more risks, we can exp explore or experiment? Or do you argue for a, for a, 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 you know, a, a, a breadth of the permanent and the, uh, and the temporary? Sculpture has always been an art that deals with time, everything is temporal. Permanence is relative. As Euclid says, uh, time is, there is no such thing as universal time. Time is always an accident of movement. Everything is moving. We are, we are astronauts. We are spinning uh, at 75,000 kilometers an hour as we uh, delusorily believe that we are in a stable world. Um, and I think that sculpture, that there is no one way. I, I think that the language of sculpture is continually rather like uh, the space of the cosmos expanding. And I think that so long as we recognize the temporal as one of the temporal and the, and the spatial, in other words, that scale and mutability from the mineral concentration of something like Iron Baby to uh, yeah, uh, a, yeah, physical, biological bodies as in one another, that the, the engagement with time is at the core of what sculpture can do. Context, obviously, you've, uh, you've, you've wrestled with. And, and works are very specifically contextualized and then sometimes have a, a universal resonance. Briefly, with a work like Event Horizon, um, I mean, asking you really as an anthropologist, really, as much as an artist, when you install Event Horizon in those different cities, you showed us New York, but as I said, Sao Paulo, Brasilia, Rio, Hong Kong, London, were there substantial differences in the ways the works activated the urban context and the way people responded? Or did you see a kind of human universalism in, in, in response? No, there. I mean, it's interesting because you know site specificity is a really important thing. Every time you install a work, you are having a conversation uh, with a place, and a, a, or you're having a conversation with the space that hopefully the work can make into a place. In other words, a place of meeting, of inquiry, of dwelling. And I, I, I think that it, it's, it's intriguing, isn't it, that, that uh, with Event Horizon, every time you're, in some senses, trying to position these works, as with Iron Baby, in the most uh, acupuncturally precipient place, so at a nerve uh, node that will activate uh, people's attitude to the to the place but you met you missed out a city it was it was also installed in Rotterdam and if I think of the widest kind of range of uh, the way that that work worked it was between Rotterdam and and New York uh, New York being the original social experiment that, that that invented the high rise so you were always looking up at at quite an acute angle and with Rotterdam, you were much, much more aware of a laterality of, of in, in a sense, this land that uh, the sea should be covering. Uh, and they worked very, very differently. But they both, they, they both had this ambition. 
to somehow be uh, yeah, agents of, in a way, wayfinding or uh, recognition that the built world in, it, in its variety and in the, the, the kind of dialogue between mass and space is very, very similar to a natural landscape and that we tend to forget it. We tend to take it for granted. And I think that's what all, I think, good sculpture does. It relinks you with the context, with the, the, the space it finds itself in. And it relinks you with the people that you find in that place. And through them and through the combination of the two, perhaps links you uh, to the history of that place and to a thought about, about, about how, it, how it might continue. You mentioned the built environment and, and, and I suppose so much of this depends on opportunity. So in order to get the opportunity to, to plan or make buildings, you need to be commissioned. Uh, in order to put uh, sculpture in the public arena, you still need to get the opportunity. You need to be commissioned or given the space and so on. Although, obviously, the, you can also leverage, as you did, you know, reputation, connections and so on for an existing work with Event Horizon and then ask other cities if they're interested in taking it. How easy is it and how much more joined up could it be to bring artists urban planners, architects, politicians, uh, developers together so that we have these sites or opportunities for more public art? Or do you think the notion of more public art per se is something we need to be questioning of? I know, I think, I think it's an interesting time now, this time of lockdown and basically social distancing. Um, the, the, the fact is that, uh, yeah, art that is out in the elements uh, is suddenly maybe recognised for what it is, that it's, it, it can add an imaginative dimension to an otherwise utilitarian world. And I think, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm dubious about, as it were, a huge ex explosion of, uh, as it were, art in, art in public space is good for you. I think that would be, that would be a mistake. I think, I think that... Uh, in a, in, in a sense, the, the natural resistance is not a bad thing. I, I, always, I often think that you know, the resistance of marble that faced Michelangelo has been replaced today, perhaps, by a kind of res resistance of uh, you know, municipal bodies, planning departments, uh, health and safety uh, to uh, these objects. But it's an, I, I think, yeah, I, I, I fundamentally believe the art of its nature uh, was made to be shared. And the invention of the museum and the gallery is really an invention of the Enlightenment and is a, you know, from the last 300 years. If you go back 3,000 years and you look at our Neolithic ancestors, if you look at Stonehenge or Karnak or any of the mounds, the Ohio mounds in, in America, or any of the amazing uh, yeah, terraformings of, of, of China, you see art that was absolutely collectively made and collectively shared in collective space. And I think of that as being its natural state. So the Gothic cathedrals of Europe is a, a, are another example of this, or you know, the, the, the extraordinary works in Poland or, 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 or Anuradhapura, or the, the caves of Elora and Ajanta, all spaces that were made over centuries collectively for collective physical and imaginative inhabitation. So this... this, this we're losing, we've lost you again, just as you were summarising, actually, Anthony, and the session... This invention of a term called public... I'm very sorry uh, about the technical difficulties. I, I, I was just, uh, yeah, contradicting the idea that, that public art uh, is a special term. It's, it's either art or it's not art. Yeah, but I love the atavistic reference to ancient civilizations as well as a futuristic 
model in a way of, of you know, we've done it in this way in certain ways. There's many good things from the past. Let's look at it for the future collectively. But we need to question what we do. And it, it's the quality of art that prevails in the end, not public decoration. Anyway, on that note, hopefully of questioning still and uh, for, for an artist who produces some of the most technologically advanced and difficult work in the world, um, sorry that we were occasionally floored by the technology of the internet, but we still got most of that session. Anthony Gormley, thank you very much. Thank you.